Welcome to part six of the Etchpass demo videos. I hope you're enjoying. Uh, we're going to look at how to attach the roof to the body today. Um, we're also going to look at how we're going to start making the interior from Plasticard. And we're going to look at how to clean up the brass before we paint it as well. So we're really getting forward now. Once we've got the roof on, this will really look like a coach. So uh, hope you're getting involved. Uh, do like and subscribe and uh, we'll uh, get straight on with the roof. So in a previous episode, I mentioned Festinial Railway Saloon 808. Uh, this has unusual doors. Uh, and as it happens, Sunday afternoon, I was just doing a bit of soldering anyway. And I thought I would add this to the video because it's interesting. Um, these are inset doors um, and they are separate to the body side. Um, you'll also notice on this that there's a small window at one end. So you've got to make sure you put the door the right end um, so check photos etc drawings if you can although this is such a new carriage there are no drawings I know, I'm aware of um, but the fact that incest is quite interesting so they've got a 90 degree fold and they've got and I hope you can see this there a, a series of kind of open kind of areas you can see daylight through uh, and that helps you bend that 90 degree bend of course but it means you've got some holes through there once you're painting it. And I've tried filling those with solder with limited effect. They're just too big uh, to get a decent kind of fillet of solder in there. So I actually use a Humbrol filler or we could use Milliput as well um, after the fact. But what you do have to do, of course, then is align it all together. So I just wanted to show how I would do that when I solder it up. So I've got a set square on the bottom because the crucial part is that the very bottom edge of the carriage uh, is aligned with the bottom edge of the door. Because if you look at prototype photos, that is all very, very straight. So we can use a uh, set square to do that. But because the way these will be uh, soldered, if we don't add some blue tack, as I've done here, to keep this end up, then it will solder on an angle. Um, and that will cause problems later um, with the ends and then bowing under the whole thing will go wrong. So um, I've set this up, set square at the bottom to keep it um, aligned along the bottom. Nice piece of glass to make sure it's perfectly flat. And then a tiny little bit of blue tack in there just to keep it at the right height. And I just basically stuffed it inside. And then the rest is, as per we have discussed, a um, little bead of, of flux. And then you've just got to get the iron in there carefully without moving any of it. So we'll see how that goes. Got a little bit on there. Uh, the first time I did that, I didn't have any solder on the iron, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, but now I've got a piece on, it's happy, and then we can put a little bit more on. Quite a lot of solder there that I dumped on. So now it's uh, broadly set. We can move the other bits away, and that gives us a bit more space to move the rest of the solder around without obviously unsoldering the bit that we've already done. Okay. And we have an inset door attached. I did the single door a minute ago. Um, so that's one side, I'll do the other side. And then with these, uh, the, the ends then go under there. So an unusual carriage. Um, it's something to do with loading gauge, I think, um, because of the end throw of the, of the carriage. But um, worth just showing you how to add those inset doors. Um, and don't worry about getting a solder kind of filling in there. I, I, You kind of can try, but it's hard. And you probably undo the other fillet there. Um, so better to just use some filler after the fact. Um, the other point that's worth mentioning whilst I'm here uh, is for the chassis, so not the camera then, um, that will need to sit inside those fillets that we've just created. So we will need to get a, uh, a 
file in there and just uh, make sure that that sits square. Sorry, it's the other way around. Disabled access towards that end. There you go. Happy days. Okay, so we've annealed the roof and you can look at the previous uh, version of this video to see how we did that. You'll see that the brass has kind of changed colour and that's allowed it to bend into a nice radius. And we've got that radius approximate. It doesn't need to be absolutely perfect, but broadly similar to the radius of this end. And the important bit is that that radius is the same all the way along the piece of brass. So that's ready. Um, and the way I tend to do this, and I suspect other people have other methods, so this is just one method, but I think it works well for me, is um, we, we've obviously got to make sure that the, the sides are as straight as possible along their edge. We've got to make sure that the uh, piece of brass that makes the roof is in the middle of the, of the ends there. And we've just got to make sure that the whole thing is ultimately square. So the first thing I do is just look at the sides and just check that in everything we've been doing, putting drop lights in and, and the steps and anything we've been we've been screwing it and taking it apart again and handling it quite a bit. We may well have just introduced some slight bends into the brass and just with your fingers you can go through and make those as good as possible. They don't need to be totally perfect, but you want something that looks broadly right and you want the ends to be at 90 degrees and if you get a set square out and check that if you if you want it etc but once you're happy and of course at this stage you can still undo these fillets and resolder them again if you feel it's not square in some dimension or it feels like it's bowing out either end or at a diagonal on the end but i'm pretty happy with this so now we're going to put the roof on once we've got the roof on it's a lot harder to alter those things i just mentioned so what i like to do is Firstly, check how much overhang we've got at either end. And because this was a pre-made roof um, by the kit designer, the overhang is minimal, both ends. So we're going to be very careful that we don't introduce a lovely little bit of overhang here to give ourselves plenty of room to solder it, and then end up at the other end not having enough brass. So we're going to have to get this perfect first turn, otherwise the other end will look, um, look ridiculous. So what I tend to do is get it in um, one end first. So the usual rules, we've talked about this plenty of times, nice hot iron, clean it, something like this, or wire wool or something like that. Uh, ahead of time, use the tip cleaner if you've got it, manky brush and the uh, flux. And I do it from obviously the inside because we don't want the soldering on the outside of the coach because that will then make painting much more difficult and ultimately uh, it won't look great. So we're gonna solder in here so we're going to get the, the iron in there and we want to try and get it as good as possible but as before as we've said a number of times you don't want to solder the whole thing at once just get a bit of a tack on that a little piece just to hold it in place and then you can view it at all angles check it's right and before you actually go in and make the full um, final fillet for the whole thing so keeping it as straight as we possibly can. Now, the minute we push down, that will deform the brass roof underneath and it will move it out of square. So you've got to have enough pressure to keep it where you want it, but not deform. And just make sure the other end is, is broadly okay. We've got to keep the overhang at, at both sides the, broadly the same. And we've got to keep the overhang this end to a minimum because we know there's minimal brass at the other end to play with. So once you're happy, and I'm gonna be very, very careful, I've got my smoke absorber on, I've got the flux in, but I'm still fiddling until I'm happy. So this is not gonna look rubbish. And just keep on until you feel it's about as good as we can get it. And then put a small amount of solder in the back just to tack it in place. And hopefully when you put it up, it's, uh, it's fine. And then you can look very carefully at the ends and check that the overhang here is the same as the overhang there. And I would say 
the low is absolutely bang on. And the overhang all the way along, which angle can I show you this at? They're probably there is the best. Is broadly the same all the way along. Now, of course, if there's a slight issue, you can get in and file it um, so that it looks right, but that is very good. So we're now going to go back in with some more flux. And the, the important bit now is to get the corners in place. So we've got it tacked where we broadly want it. We can check once again the other end, check that uh, everything's in place, and you're going to have a bit of overhang, which we just check that there. We will have a bit of overhang, but yeah, it's, it's minor, really, really minor. So you've got to get this right, otherwise you won't have much of an overhang. I have actually ended up with more overhang here than here, but there's enough and I can just, perhaps just uh, file that. One thing you do need to do, of course, then is to tilt the, the carriage and then press gently in the corner, just to make sure that when the solder uh, solidifies, it, it does and doesn't leave a gap here. Um, so, well, it's just showing how I do that. So a little bit of solder on there, which I fell off. And make sure you've got an overhang, make sure it's all good. Press down enough and bend the, the brass across just to make sure you've got enough. And then when you've got both corners in, one, two and the middle, you can then use the solder that's already there just to fill the rest of the gaps between those three pieces, which we've done. There, easy as that really. So there we go. You can see on the end we've got our roof on. You can see inside, hopefully there, at the angle right, you can see the Phillips solder in there. And we're effectively then going to do the same the other end. I don't know, I'll follow, talk about it. So the important thing here is that we keep these sides nice and straight so the easy thing would be to to bend it and you can see these bowing out if i press too hard here so we want to keep this nice and straight and of course at the same time we want to go and and have the same overlap as we've got this end this end so that it all looks the same down the length of the coach um, and really these are probably the most important soldered fillets in the entire kit because they're the bit that people will see um, from above in the viewing position and um, they are crucial to making sure that the kit and the carriage looks right. So take your time on it. I'm not saying it's hard, I'm just saying they're crucial and, and therefore if, uh, if we went wrong with them they'd show more than other places. So we've popped on a, a little piece there, we're going to check the ends. And we are here in a good place. So as you're soldering it, just keep the pressure, and I mean gentle pressure, just enough to keep the two bits of brass together on each corner as you do it. So rock it forward, rock it back as you do each one. And then we have the fillet done the other end. So now you're thinking, how are we going to do this side piece? Now, um, the way I do this is I like to tack in several places, probably four or five places along here, just to make sure that the distance between the side of the coach and the overlap of the roof as it goes along the side is broadly the same. And if some of it has moved about slightly, um, then I will go in and and re-make the solder join until I'm happy, and then flux the whole lot and flow solder throughout the rest. So similar approach really to that that I've used throughout this kit build, in that you put in a little dab of solder enough to hold it so we can check it's in the right place, and wait until we're ready and we're happy, and then we can put the full solder on. If you put all the solder on all together at first, then it really is so much more difficult to make up those little minor adjustments which make all the difference to making a really quality product so we're going to do a side so um we'll have a look at both sides we'll make sure they're as nice and straight as possible just by using fingers to keep everything in place i tend to do it pulling it towards me 
holding it in place. You're so far from the actual solder join that you're not going to get hot, so um, we're all good. And then dropping bits of solder on as we go. You can probably put the flux along the whole way because then it's in every position you need. And I would start with the middle. So get it as, as close to where you want it as possible and then dump a tack solder on. And really at this stage, turn it off a second, at this stage that the carriage should be close to looking uh, like it's complete. I mean, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a lot of bend in it and there isn't in this one. Um, so then we can really just get the nine, yeah, 95, 96, 97% kind of uh, right. And um, once you've got that on, some people actually just put a couple of tacks on, leave it, paint it like that. Um, I feel like it should have a, a, a solder join along the whole way because that's how they really build coaches and gives it a bit more strength uh, and certainly avoids being bent accidentally in the future. But technically, yes, you could. You could do it this way and have a perfectly good coach. So I'm just going to, I find that around where the doors are tends to have been bent a little bit more as we were putting the drop lights in and that kind of thing. And they've just moved away from the square. So I've just popped in three blobs, one, two, three, and I started kind of moving that around a bit. Um, and now once we're happy, we can then join those up with the final fillet and then do exactly the same on the other side and uh, I'll do that and come back to you. Crucial thing here is that as you're moving the solder about it will be easy to knock the brass side out of alignment so be very gentle with it just enough heat to make the solder flow. So there we go two roofs soldered on solder fillets inside need cleaning up yet but nicely square at the ends, overlap the same broadly all the way along. Nice and straight along the way and overlap the same at the ends. So all good. So then I did the Festinjog Saloon 808 Bob uh, in exactly the same way. So cut out a piece of brass, bent it, uh, didn't need annealing this one because uh, it bent nicely um, and then popped in the fillets of solder. I haven't cleaned it up yet, so it's a little bit messy in there along the way. This one's slightly unusual because it has the inset doors, so there's a little bit of faffing around um, to get make sure that the, the roof sits nice and, and flat above that. I just used some uh, flat-nosed pliers just to try and ensure that. Um, and you, frankly, can fiddle with the roof forever. Um, to get it exact. Um, this one is is pretty good. I'm quite happy with that. I think it's broadly straight. Uh, there are a few little ups and downs, but we're talking about a tenth of a millimetre or something like that. And of course, you've got to make sure that the um, the sides are, are, are straight and parallel so that once you put the um, floor in, it, uh, it all lines up. So, I, I, you can faff with it forever. I don't actually put a fillet of solder over the inset door pieces. Um, I'm not really entirely sure why, but you can't see it and it gives you a little bit of room just to move it about at the ends. So really what we want to do is remove any flux deposits. Now hopefully you'll have washed it in between soldering sessions so there won't be a lot on there but we just want to make sure we get rid of the rest of that just before that manky greeny oxidation stuff or chemical reaction happens. Um, we also want to try and remove any tarnish that might affect paint, any grease from, you know, greasy fingernails and that kind of thing. Uh, various ways of doing that. Um, you can use Vim, uh, which is like a powdery uh, cleaning scourer. And I've got an old toothbrush here, which is an electric one, just a battery operated one that I think a kid had at some point and it had uh, seen the end of its life and therefore can now be used uh, for vim scouring um, and literally just pour that on top of the brass with a little bit of water and then get in there with the, the, the toothbrush into the nooks and crannies and that kind of thing and that'll do a good job 
Um, you can also use things like uh, Barkeeper's Friend or Viacal. Now these are a bit more acidic and what you would tend to do is use these first to really clean up the brass, get it all shiny. And Vim is more alkaline, um, so probably use that after the, the fire cow and various people online will uh, have their own kind of um, systems the important thing is to clean it and then neutralize whatever cleaner you've used and the best for that is water of course um, so this is the way I used to do it, it seemed to work perfectly fine um, and no issues there but I've now moved on to an ultrasonic cleaner and this is a uh, ultrasonic cleaner here um, and I use this stuff C clean Two, in fact, um, which is sold as a easy cleaning metal and jewellery um, cleaning solution, uh, which is exactly what we want to do because we want to um, clean this brass. So in here we have the C Clean uh, put in as per the instructions. I use the medium staining instruction, which is two 10 mil capfuls for every 400 millilitres of warm tap water. Now this ultrasonic cleaner, which was probably about £100, you can get cheaper ones though, this has a heating function. So I can keep this water in here and use it several times before having to re, um, remake the, um, the, the sea clean recipe. Uh, but if you haven't got one that heats, then just use warm water uh, and you just have to do it each, each time. Um, so it has both a heating function and the ultrasonic function. And it has a basket here, which lifts out, um, and uh, you can easily pop your uh, models in whilst they're being cleaned. And of course you can do jewelry or other things at once as well. And then there's a timer kind of function which auto turns itself off. Um, I tend to use about 10 minutes, um, but it depends on the level of, of staining or mank on the model um, and of course you could use this for cleaning airbrushes um, so getting the, the paint out of the nozzle of, a, of an airbrush um, or um, anything really that's got ingrained kind of um, dirt or mank that an ultrasonic bath like this which effectively puts a, an ultrasonic set of waves through the through the um, the water and kind of jiggles them about a bit like a microwave does with with food to heat it and um, does the same but loosens dirt in an ultrasonic way um, clever little machine and can really save you time particularly if you're doing lots together um, things to think about make sure it's deep enough to take any etched brass you're doing obviously that depends on the scale you're using my 009 um, isn't that deep so you know, i can easily pop that in there and I've still got a bit of space as well. Um, you might not want to put in anything that's had super glue on it. And I've just thought actually that the two ends of um, there where I've glued the benches on might actually come loose in, but I can re-glue re them later if that's the case. Um, so pop the top on. I find that these little clips, if you went for this kind of thing, need to be put inside, otherwise it makes a, a pretty substantial noise because the lid is also metal. Um, and obviously plug into the mains, little switch at the back, on it comes. Uh, I tend to, um, you can go up and down with the temperature, so here I tend to put it you know, relatively warm and set that going it's at 17 at the minute and then you can you can alter the uh, the time here and I usually put that to about 10 then I'll need to let it get a bit warmer first so here is the ultrasonic cleaner doing its thing and you can see bits of hopefully you can see that on the picture bits of kind of mank and stuff coming off the coach as it is uh, being ultrasonically cleaned uh, the temperature's going up gone to 25 already um, so we'll keep that going for about nine minutes uh, and see how it looks in a minute there we go so I've just lifted this out of the sea clean and I will just now brush this with water uh, one of the things that always happens is the area around the solder starts to go black um, kind of gray black that's normal uh, and you may get a few other marks uh, around on the 
the actual brass but it's uh, cleaned it really well I'm going to just put that under the water um, and then it'll be pretty much ready for spraying so whilst I'm here I'm just going to show you how we would add the truss rods to a carriage so this here is a mystery carriage um, you can look up online if you search Festipedia carriage mystery uh, you can find out the history of this thing. It is believed to be, and I believe it to be, North Wales Narrow Gauge Railway number three, a quarryman's coach, which of which there are only three or four known photographs after it was withdrawn. Um, my own personal theory is it may have been used on the Bryn Gwyn branch and therefore wasn't photographed very much, or if it ever actually. Um, but no one knows for sure. So uh, all we know is there was a carriage at the back of Boston Lodge Works for a period next to the crane uh, and it disappeared. It no longer exists and no one really knows what it was, but it would make sense from other historical research that it's a Quarren's car number three. But anyway, I'll leave you to read about that if you want. We're going to look at the truss rods. So here we have the chassis. I've built a little quick uh, interior, real simple because you can't really see an awful lot through these uh, windows anyway. And then I've added some styrene strippers, an H piece. This is a bit deeper than I ordinarily would do because the carriage is, uh, so the chassis is sitting quite uh, high inside the carriage to allow it to, once it's got its bogies, sit low. Um, and then I've bent a piece of nickel silver wire uh, that really is just a case of using the flat nose pliers and trying to get the right angle. Uh, a little piece of, um, you could use various things for that, tightening that. I've actually used some insulation um, from wire, which I'll glue in place in the middle. I actually use super glue here and here, and then two dobs of dabs even, of solder either side to uh, keep it in place. Simple as that, really. Um, a bit of trial and error with it um, to try and make sure it looks equal, that these uh, triangle shapes look broadly equal either side. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty good. And once you then pop that under the carriage, uh, you can see the, the effect you get. And if I turn it that way up, you'll see, you hardly see it anyway, but it just adds that little bit of extra realism. So to solder it on, Get it into place as close as you can and blob some flux there and then once you're happy that it is equal to the one you've put on the other side or to the uh, design you want, dab a little bit of solder on, doesn't need a lot and hold it until it solidifies and then we can move it across just check it looks about right, looking through to the other side, all good. And of course, because it's wire, you could get in with these uh, flat nose pliers and, and move it about if you need to. Do the same the other end, trying to make sure it's equidistant in all the planes that are required. And voila. Uh, although that's all, and I've kind of made a bit of a blob of it, so I'll just go back and flatten that solder out by re melting it. And then, of course, we'll have these in the middle. Turn it off so you can hear me. And we have some truss rods. Voila. Okay, so there are the truss rods on. A little dab of glue there and there. I actually, in the end, used, sorry, I hope you can see that, um, for the tightening nut pieces, a little bit of heat shrink, which is a special stuff you can buy for electronics. You pop it on, uh, in this case, onto the nickel silver wire, and then introduce some heat, could be the, uh, the end of the soldering iron or a heat gun or something, and that shrinks it. So as well as truss rods, we can look at some interiors. So as I've said before, you can go a bit crazy about interiors, and it, uh, you can go too far. Um, but I just wanted to show a, a couple. So this one here is actually in for painting and I'm use this life color stuff in Future video. We'll, we'll have a look at that. This is half painted. So not complete yet But uh, this one here is for um, a very similar carriage to this super barn that we talked about Bob um, and What I've done with Bob it's easier just to see it on Bob is I've put a, a simple piece of 30 thou plastic card as a base and once you've cut it to the right width you then from underneath can get a small sharpie and I use this thing 
permanent marker with an ultra fine point, if you can see it there, uh, to dab through there, through the, um, the nut, to denote where on this piece of plaster card you need to then drill the hole and using the, the pin vise you obviously drill a two mil uh, uh, hole out and then put it back over it line them up as you can see i've done there and super glue it in place um, using that rocket rapid stuff and that then is a really nice base for which you can build your interior on and i use for this particular carriage i have um, a really good friend rob boiler who you'll see on Bron Hebog, and you can look at his blog online, which is often full of really interesting uh, modelling around Festinia or Welsh Island prototypes. And he's actually created out of plaster card a, a master and then resin um, moulded, um, resin cast, sorry, uh, a series of um, seat and table uh, sections. The, the table top actually comes separately, and you can glue that on top. Um, but then you can tessellate these quite easily by adding them like this so that each um, table then sits with a set of uh, seat backs and then another table and another table. And obviously once you get to the end of the carriage you'll probably have to chop them like I've done here to have a single uh, seat. Um, or in some cases looking at, obviously make sure you've looked at photographs of, of the real thing. You can get uh, single, single seats both ends there. That's actually a an area for wheelchair um so you can use a resin cast seat like that or you may find um that the particular prototype you're looking to do and of course the one we've done is fair of ride or doesn't have that in which case i created the partitions again from 30 thou a uh, bit of trial and error getting this radius right just keep on um testing it against the the inside of the the actual coach and you'll get there eventually uh, obviously cut it too big to start with and then take tiny pieces off until you're happy and then i tend to use these which are um dundas uh, they're actually velofridal um coach seats um, from a different kit and the mystery cars using something similar as well these i've reused from a, another kit i uh, didn't need anymore and uh, in fact this one's got a bit of a hole out to one of the seats but given it's a quarryman's car and a very old one, um, doesn't really matter because that probably was exactly what they were like inside. So what I've done is take some Plastruct, which is um, available um, all kinds of model shops um, and, and on eBay as well. And you can then uh, just glue these to the plaster card base. So, you've got... so I use the Plastruct pieces as bases to then put the done the seats on top and I've done something similar here and you can get various types you can get solid ones but obviously if you get the ones with a hole in the middle and kind of rectangular or square shaped then uh, you don't need as much cutting uh, I use a razor saw it's actually a tool I didn't talk about uh, in the first episode of this series this is my razor saw bog standard decent blade these will last a long time but eventually the teeth will uh, will uh, show their age and you'll need a new one but yeah very easy get it uh, nice and straight and just up and down motions and then you'll obviously have to clean up a little bit of uh, flash or, or mank etc uh, afterwards so we use those as little bases and because they're plastic you can glue them straight onto the plastic false floor that you've created now that false floor as well can create um, a bit of extra stiffness in the body as well and that's actually quite important for this carriage because as you can see I have not got the side sorry I'll get my hand in the way these side strengthening pieces of brass that we talked about early earlier in the um, in the build which kind of retain the side I've not been able to put them on this carriage because when you do that they're too wide I think it's an, maybe an error in the kit uh, well, it must be, I guess. Uh, they're just slightly too wide. Once you take them off, that's absolutely fine and it all fits together beautifully. But uh, it, it just doesn't work. So that means this is a bit more flexible than, than it ordinarily would. Although you have got these um, extra pieces of the chassis which do also help. And once you glue on a nice bit of plaster card, it certainly helps. And then, of course, all the seats.
So very quickly, let's talk about cements for plastic to plastic. Um, I've got a few different options here. Um, I've got Mr. Hobby Mr. Cement S, um, which I was told by our local model shop is um, the best available for just general use. And I have found it to be very good. Although I've only been using it for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I would probably use this for most general jobs. Uh, nice screw on lid and a decent sized brush inside. Keep the lid on when you're not using it and try not to inhale the uh, fumes. Not terribly good for you, so be in a uh, well ventilated area. Um, and then we have the extra thin cement which comes with similar bottle with a much smaller um, brush inside you can see there so that's a bit, bit better for getting into detailed places and I've also tried this quick setting one but I actually find it sets so quickly um, that it, <laughs> you you can't almost get the piece of plastic in the right place uh, so I find it to be of limited use but it's there as well in the arsenal just in case this here comes with a long nozzle which means you can get it right into wherever you are trying to glue etc like this and you just squeeze um, this is more of a gel these are more liquid and this yeah there are certain types of 3d printing actually you can glue with this as well found that you can glue coal in place quite well a few things like that um, and it's been been quite good as well and i do like this long um, tube which allows you to get right into places but it can get clogged up so make sure you get that on and clean it up every now and again. There are other things you can use. Met pack is the classic, um, although actually to get pure mech is more difficult. You may find you can actually buy yourself um, the pure chemical mech online, um, a lot cheaper than some of the uh, model shops actually um, repackage it in some kind of um, brand or something like that. So have a look at that. There's a lemon, um, one, one called limonene which is made from lemon which is meant to be a bit more natural um tried it i didn't find it that great at sticking needed an awful lot um to make the uh, make a good glued joint but it's an option as well and there are lots and lots of others too but i've found this to be um pretty good in the couple of weeks i've used it but i'd also use one of one of these to get in but for this job um, here where we're going to be gluing the plastruct um, pieces underneath these dunder seats the back of the dunder seats gluing to the base and then the whole thing onto the plastruct and then the plastruct onto the base plastic then i'd go with mr cement s